Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 400. Science Faction, I call BS. There's like a moment I have to imagine when Sisyphus was pushed in the rock. Yeah, up, yeah. You know, perhaps for the 400th time. Uh-huh. Where he's just wondering, like, why am I doing this? Yeah, why do oh. I keep insisting on losing every time? It would be like that only if Sisyphus then got near the top of the hill, got out of the way, and actually pushed the boulder down. First off, now that I'm kind of in Sisyphus's mind, mm-hmm. I understand. I understand the mentality. Like, fuck you, Zeus. Yeah. I got all of eternity. I'm going to let it roll down the hill. And also, they never explained what would happen if you just said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm laying at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> yeah, I do yeah, think. What's it... worse than pushing a rock up the hill I, that I will think... make you do it? What, did, didn't they, like. Chain him to it, and every they didn't well, they chain him, the rock. Down I the think they the chained time. him to a boulder, and like every day, a vulture ate his liver. No, 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 that's that's Prometheus. Oh, okay. Prometheus, yeah. different guy. Duh. Wow, a lot of punishments for gods back yeah. then. I bet he had some like really powerful legs pushing that boulder <laughs> up the hill. Yeah, I'm on the Prometheus workout, bro. Yeah. <laughs> Most of my CrossFit was inspired by Greek mythology. <laughs> I wrestle a lion. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of wrestling a lion, I of course I'm your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me as always is my comedian, Mr. Damian Mercado. Damian, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing 400. I know them. I know I missed my 300 reference, but uh-huh. I mean like. This is, I call BS. I'm sorry, you've uh-huh. beaten the enthusiasm out of me. Yeah, well, it's not difficult. I don't have that much enthusiasm or you. All right, and our science guest host for the afternoon, Bill. Bill, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. I, I wish I had worn my lion costume so that I could fit in with that reference mm-hmm. where you're fighting a lion. <laughs> When you said, like, worn his lion costume, there are very few science hosts where I would be like, oh, he's just being facetious. He yeah, yeah, no. Have a lion costume. <laughs> no, no. But if Bill told but me. But when I... Bill said that, Damien, I thought the same thing, which was like, <laughs> which lion costume, Bill? <laughs> his furry costume, which is like way over the top. Yeah, That's yeah. the most costume. Yeah, you can absolutely. Get. Then he's got the authentic one from the Wizard of Oz that he uses. <laughs> that was a lot of makeup. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's a lot of the accent. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of coming off as a gay in the 1920s. <laughs> As uh, a gay. <laughs> All right, let's move right <laughs> That's on. Probably how it would have been said, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I was That's going back to That's historically accurate. Hey, who could play a gay lion? <laughs> As a studio exec with a big cigar. Hey, toots, get over here. I wonder if there's any like recorded observations of homosexual lions. There has to be. absolutely sure. Yeah, like there, there's gay animals everywhere. Well, yeah, but I, I don't know about lions. Are you some kind of lion homophobe? Because you're coming off real weird here, Bill. I don't know why you brought this up. I'm not sure what you have. Are you part of, like, focus on the lion family? <laughs> I'm just saying that those lions could be top. That a sweet lion vagina is what they really want. And if the devil would leave their heart. Lion Jesus didn't sacrifice himself for our sins. I so you could go around fucking other lion dudes, Bill. Can you imagine the manes on gay lions? <laughs> yeah, super They're, well done. Oh, my They're God. Permed Great and crimped. It. Lion fashion would not be where it is without gay lions, Bill. That lion yeah. isn't particularly big, but he's fucking jacked, dude. It has to work out. I'm not going to say. Like all the time. <laughs> really breaking a lot of gay lion stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's move away from this lion homophobia and right on to I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. Bill's lion homophobia. Whoa. Really? I wouldn't have called that. <laughs> of all the tall, I would have thought Bill would be the most lion gay tolerant. <laughs> yeah, you know, on the surface, you're the most woke scientist we have, but right. do we just hit your issue? Yeah, well, he's pretty conservative when it comes he's, to felines. He's a single issue voter. <laughs> it's just about gay lions. <laughs> All right, article number one. Researchers believe they have found specific biomarkers in the blood that are indicative of an individual having suffered a concussion, meaning we may soon have a blood test for concussions. Do you mean it's a science or bad science? Well, yeah, because it's called alcoholism and, <laughs> and a lot of other things that come oh, with, with, it, with, just with. If if they look at you, that's the blood test. They, they take your your blood alcohol level. If it's too high, they think you probably had a concussion. Oh, no, I think it's like a formula. We take your blood. We can see mm-hmm. how long it's been. We can see, like, and, and how many concussions you've had, how many okay. TBIs you've had. Like, oh, uh, shit. Uh, this this blood shows that you've been drunk for uh, seven days. Oh, and you beat your family. Oh my God, this guy's had many concussions. And but then they might get to the point where like this guy just uh, flips out irrationally. He's not to the point where he beats his family. He's just an unpleasant coworker. Uh huh. Or they're like. This this makes you really love like Norwegian death metal. Like that's how we can tell. We can see the small Norwegian death metal proteins in your blood that are <laughs> indicative of some kind of head trauma. 
It's fucking metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is only surpassed by the blood of people who like reggae, which is even worse. <laughs> That's, you know what? Given the two options, you know, like if you are somebody who has suffered a lot of concussions and mm-hmm. you've had a lot of damage, I'd much rather have you go in the reggae route. Let's smooth you out. Let's, yeah, yeah. let's eliminate those highs. Yeah, the headbanging. The headbanging yeah. is not good. For, for the concussed people. I guess that's true. I I do have the theory, though, that, like, reggae will never get you motivated to do anything except listen to more reggae, whereas, like... Well, the the reason better might motivate you to shoot up a church, Yes, I mean, or, so. <laughs> or take your own life. Either way. <laughs> oh, my God. Listen, I'm, I'm pro-reggae in this situation mm-hmm. because if not every church shooting, that'd be on your head, Bobby. Yeah, I guess so. All right, and Bill. Okay, so... Uh, I'm thinking when you are concussed, some of the symptoms come from swelling sure. in your brain, and that swelling is blood coming out of places where it should normally be. Mm-hmm. But there is also the blood-brain barrier, and I just don't know enough about anatomy to tell if like a concussion could disrupt that barrier. But I am going to say this is bad science. All right, article number two. Researchers have just discovered how certain traumatic events can turn some people's hair gray. Damien, is this science... Or bad science. This is science. Um, I started going gray pretty early, and uh, you are you did, but you didn't get like you have a little bit of salt and pepper. You're not really salt and pepper. You got a Nick Fury thing going where you got like one patch oh, at know. the temple. You know, I'm, I'm aware of how the, the sexiness of my. <laughs> oh, of my, is that my, what you call it? Oh, I mean, listen, I'm I'm not a lady. I I, I, I this is this is see <laughs> prove it. I'm, first I'm, of all. I'm <laughs> Bobby, this is Bobby tries to trick me into exposing myself yeah, once yeah. every episode. Just dip and, your balls in soy sauce. Yeah. Yeah. That's all we want. This tastes like Bobby's hand again. <laughs> okay, so I mean, but I mean, like, I went to war, had mm-hmm. a traumatic marriage, and I yep. like that was where a lot of my grades come. But like now, I'm now I'm leveled out a bit more. Uh-huh. I feel like like uh, so you think you like, got the gray trauma. early, but then you, once you mellowed out, you stopped going gray. I think it slowed down. I think okay. I think I was forced to go gray a little bit early. Uh huh. But now that I've kind of, you know, that I've uh, become a little bit more zen right. in my older age, I, I feel like it's slowed down. I feel like the number of grades has slowed. Uh, it will catch up. Let me just say, I remember when you came back from Iraq, no gray hair, though after the divorce, you are right. You very quickly got dangerous. So what you're saying, your divorce was literally worse than war. No, the that marriage sounds- was. No, no, the marriage was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the divorce was I, don't, I don't know if you saw, but I didn't get all great. those gray hairs after the yeah, divorce. That's right. they, they were, that was the culmination when yeah. I looked in the mirror like, oh my my God, I need to get out of this. It's sucking the life out of me. The succubus. Uh, never I hope really. she's doing great. <laughs> All right, and Bill. Like, anecdotally, I can think of people who I know who were in a traumatic, not not necessarily event, but mm-hmm. like lifestyle and got some gray hairs. But sure. that seems super anecdotal. Yep. And I bet it has a lot of other factors going on. You know, I, I can imagine it being some kind of hormone balance that is mm-hmm. affected by stress. But I, this seems like a fairly well-known thing. Mm-hmm. And it, it would surprise me if we just now discovered something that pointed to it being event-based. Okay. Um, I'm going to say bad science. All right. I think you used the term uh, uh, traumatic environment or traumatic... Uh, use- lifestyle? Traumatic lifestyle. Yeah. I'm picturing, you know a lot of stuntmen? No, architects. 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 Yeah. Yep. A lot of late nights. I just fight to feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> Punch me. All right. Article with, number three. With straw bridge. All right. Article number three. Researchers have found that soybean oil, the most common oil used for cooking and additives in the U.S., appears to have an impact on Alzheimer's, autism, anxiety, and depression. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science, and it. I know you're just going to assume this is my answer because it just gives me an excuse to say something inappropriate. But mm-hmm. while you're half right, mm-hmm. uh, I actually think this harkens back to an article that we talked about with Alzheimer's and oils. I'm going to say that it's not soybean oil. It is rapeseed oil, otherwise known as canola, canola oil. oil. The best marketing name change ever, like <laughs> in the early 1900s. Well, what is it marketing? Rape seeds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but they used to be called incest seeds. Uh, and uh, we thought that rape seed was a little less well, harsh. So, well, they started off as genocide seeds yeah. and just yeah. slowly make their way down. Maybe we don't kick the can down the road. Maybe yeah. we just name it something good the second time. <laughs> yeah, like, what if we just keep getting their rape seeds? And then instead of going to canola, they should have gone to, like, sexual harassment seeds. Yep. And then, like... Aziz Ansari seeds, and then, 
and then you finish it off with like Tinder ghosted seeds. You know, in order for this to get the name, that says that like the farmers, the people who worked with it regularly, the people yeah. who really could have named it anything they want, uh -huh. it says that they hated this crop that they worked <laughs> yeah. with. Fuck no, we're not crop. naming them anything. And then like the next generation hated uh, them a little ooh, less. Ooh, yeah. Damien, counterpoint. Maybe rape wasn't a bad thing back then. <laughs> They're like, you know how awesome this scene is? It rapes. <laughs> it yeah, rapes. women had a much letter. Like, it's the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, hey, should we let women vote on this? No. <laughs> rape scene. It was the 1800s. Rape was called fun sex. Like, that was. Oh, my God. <laughs> they, were, they were monsters. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about the monsters that our great, great, great grandfathers were. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and Bill. So I'm tempted to say bad science just because of the variety of things that you said that it influences sure. and the fact that we've been using it on a large scale for so long and mm -hmm. have not noticed an effect. But I have heard some weird stuff on science Twitter about oils recently. Um, I don't know. I'm Those were essential bad. oils, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say bad science. All right. And lastly, article number four. Researchers studying scientists isolated in an Antarctic research station for 14 months found that their brains actually increased in size during their time at the station, likely as a response to the bitter Antarctic cold. Damien, is this science or bad science? This has to be bad science. I mean, like, you ice a swollen knee. Mm -hmm. You know what? When your brain's swelling because you think you're so smart that you're going right. to fly to Antarctica and conduct special science. <laughs> you, you ice your brain and it shrinks. Exactly. You, you ice in that brain. That's why you got to come back, get smart okay. again, and then go back to Antarctica. Okay. Interesting. Interesting theory. Like, I like how I adopted the East Coast accent yeah. for that answer. <laughs> yeah. And as everybody knows, like, Inuit just get really small and skinny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they have a special layer of blubber around their brain to protect the brain. <laughs> All right. And Bill. I can't think of a good reason to go either way, actually. Um, <laughs> so I will say science because I said right. the other three were false. <laughs> yeah, great. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did follow along at home and see how you did. And I'm going to give a hint. First of all, are there any bonus questions? No, I don't. See, <laughs> see that, I, ah, that, that, okay, that, tells me, that tells me I'm in a good spot. Are you? I, mean, I, I just can't talk anymore. Okay. Bobby all right. find any Interesting. To take away Interesting. I will say this. One of you may have, may have gotten a perfect score. So let's go ahead and see how you guys did. Let's see how it works. Right. I don't, I wish, God damn it, I wish I could read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really though? Like, yeah, well, no, there you might don't. be some weird that would, there, there would be a lot of weird <laughs> shit. <laughs> you know the things, the Newton cradle that sits on guys' desks where you pull the ball back and, and then it swings down and hits the series of balls and the other one goes up and goes back and forth? Like, imagine those with dicks. Like, that's what's going on in my head <laughs> oh my most of the time. <laughs> I, I'm picturing plus sized women. Yeah, that too. Back yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're the ones pulling the dick yeah. back. The dicks are the outside balls. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you ever do that one where you pull all of them to the side, yes. but variable amounts? Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. It's just like the dicks are knocking into each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And they they go too early that way. Uh, that's. <laughs> It's a great science toy, and it's simultaneously a great gift for a child and the shittiest gift <laughs> yeah, for a child. Like, a child's going to be disappointed. Like, I'm going to have fun with this, but that's just because I'm a child and I'm curious. <laughs> there was a Nintendo. <laughs> All right, article number one. Researchers believe they have found specific biomarkers in the blood that are indicative of an individual having suffered a concussion, meaning we may soon have a blood test for concussions. Damien thinks this is true. Bill thinks this is false. And this one is science. Very, very interesting. So the way they did this project was really interesting. Right now, we diagnose concussion by symptoms. Meaning, if you're Wes Welker and you take a hit in the flats, then you got some guy who has a physical therapy degree looking at your eyes and having you track their finger and stuff. And it's their decision as to whether or not you go back out again. What's well, I mean, I, I played football for years. Uh -huh. Whenever we got a concussion, our coach would send us to the physical trainer, uh -huh. and he would just stick a finger up, you know, at the backside, right, and say whether we had a concussion or not. Uh -huh. I don't know what the test was. Did he, he lick the finger? No, no, no. Or after? Damien, you forgot. No, he licked the latex glove yeah. after he took it off. <laughs> oh, okay, <though>. you forgot. <laughs> you forgot part of the medical diagnosis. You got to put the finger up there and then slightly suckle on the kid's ear, and then when you do that, you can figure out if they've got a concussion. You had trainer Smith too. <laughs> <laughs> So the problem with that is, think of what this leads to, right? Like right now we have a concussion protocol in the NFL where if somebody, you know, we think they have a concussion, they get set out for a certain amount of games or plays or whatever, right? But that is all subjective. And guess what? Let's not pretend like the players who make millions of dollars playing football don't know the answers they're supposed to say to make it look like they don't have a concussion even if they do, right? So a lot of these are questions. Well, you know, wh who's the president or wh whatever it is. And if you know, and you've had a bunch of concussions before and you get r your bell rung and you know you have a concussion and you know the right answers to say, even though they're not true, to get you back out on the field, you're going to say that. 
And not only that, but the, those are just the concussions that are bad enough for film. I mean, yes. let's just let's remember that these are peak athletes performing at levels that yeah. your average athlete can can only dream of. It's like it's almost like as Bobby says, you're a different species. Yeah, you're almost yeah. like a an, it's like competing against yeah. an animal. size and was, strength and speed are, are all just unimaginable to most. It's of us. something you could never achieve. It's again like competing with a robot or an animal. You're you're going to lose. But they still have human brains. Yeah. And the speed and force at which they hit each other is giving them, like, the most mild, yeah. boring play. There's, like, three concussions that happened yeah. on that play. Yeah. Usually they're a, just the minor ones that they're used to. Yeah, it's usually yeah. the interior linemen. They, they sometimes will get a concussion on, like, every play, like micro concussions. It's really uh, bad. But regardless, what they wanted to do is they wanted to test for this because what they said is we need a blood test. We need to be able to definitively say this person has had a concussion and not leave it up to some subjective training coach or something like that. So to test this, did they just hit a bunch of mouse in the f- head and then, like, take their blood? Bill. Bill. No, Bill. Mouse Bill. football. Bill. Human trials. Wow. Yeah! <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay. <laughs> Put a helmet on somebody's head and, like, grab it. Yeah, it was they went to the research. The University of Three Stooges began this research. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> if you think about it, it's actually a really easy control por- protocol. They just got a bunch of university athletes. They tested them at the beginning of the year. Then they tested them at the end of the year, about 250 athletes. The ones that they knew got concussions, they put those in one group. The control group was the ones they knew didn't get concussions. And then uh, they could say- Like the golf? Yeah. No, versus yeah, like the yeah. football team? Oftentimes it would be the same on the football team, right? The punter? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or just somebody who didn't get, get see contact because they weren't first string. Whatever it is- they were able to do that, and then they looked at the actual results, and they found three specific proteins that are indicative of concussion. Wait, they didn't get concussions because they weren't first string? Have you seen the movie Rudy? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> do you know how many concussions that hobbit got? So they think that these three proteins are basically the result of the damage that is going on. So there's stuff with glial fibery acidic protein, which is released in response to injury to the glial cells. So that's a specific brain cell. So we think, oh, we're seeing basically that stuff getting squeezed out of the cell. That's that's one of the proteins. We got these other ones, oh. ubiquitin C-terminus and hydrolas L1. They are what are the signaling to nerve cells that other cells have been damaged. So what we're starting to pick up on is particular biomarkers that say something has happened to this brain. It has been damaged. All the students that had had known concussions, they showed elevated levels of all three of these. All the students that were known to not have concussions showed no difference. So you couldn't say this is the result of a rigorous exercise routine that an athlete has to perform because we had athletes who were not getting concussions and then we had ones that were. The athletes who are getting concussions are probably parting their ass off a lot harder after True. the games. True. Now, we don't know that this is, isn't a result Causation correlation. of drinking yeah. a lot more or crushing right. pee. Yeah. It is interesting because we may very well have a blood test for concussions quite soon and that could become part of the NFL and MMA. Okay, so here's the deal. Chances are you are going to get a concussion sometime in your life. Everybody. You don't think about it because these really small concussions happen. You're laying down in your bed and you hit your head on the bedpost. That kind of thing happens, right? But what's really bad isn't necessarily getting concussions. We're all going to get them. What's really bad is getting head trauma after having a concussion. Because in a concussion, your brain starts to swell. If you then take additional head trauma during that concussive thing, that is what causes death. That is what causes long-term brain damage and what we think causes CTE. So it's not necessarily the initial hit, it's what happens after, which is why boxing and MMA can be so bad for people, specifically boxing. Boxing's way worse because in boxing, you can literally get knocked unconscious and if the ref can stand you up in 10 seconds, you can go back in there and keep fighting that dude. In MMA, the second you can't defend yourself, the fight is over. And so therefore there's no such thing as getting knocked out and continuing to fight. So specifically with boxing, but even still with MMA and with football, we need something where we can objectively say, this person has a concussion, get them the fuck out of the ring or off the field or whatever else it is, and they don't get to go back until they no longer have these biomarkers. I mean, first off, you need a way to tell between those minor concussions. You know, I mean, like in a MMA fight, you know, sure. you would get caught with a decent jab yeah. that might ring your bell, but sure. you're still in the fight. So, I mean, and, and you could be Forrest Griffin and get knocked out with a jab by Anderson Silva. <laughs> and it wouldn't cripple the sport if every time they took the test yeah. after that. Uh, but it wouldn't if they gave them the test afterwards and they said, you got a concussion during this fight, you can't fight for three months. That's Fine. Nobody would have a problem with that. And, and here's the thing, I, you know, jokes aside, here's the thing that I think would actually be much more beneficial to society <laughs> is if you could use that, to, like child protective services could use that to test if this child is getting their ass kicked. Uh, there's no physical That's symptoms. a good point, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, like, this kid's had a lot of concussions and I don't see him, like, he's not, he's playing soccer, youth soccer. Yeah, yeah but then again, there's clumsy ass kids. Uh, it could go either way. All right, article number two. Researchers have just discovered how certain traumatic events can turn some people's hair gray. Damien thought this was true. Bill thought this was false. And this one is science. 
So we've heard stories before of people's hair turning gray due to stress. There's a famous one I think about uh, some Russian oligarchs, but the one we may know better as Americans is the story of John McCain, whose hair turned gray literally overnight when he got captured by the Viet Cong. Yeah, that's the thing about being a Russian oligarch. You think like you have all this power, yeah. but like you need to realize you could be killed at yeah. any second, man. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, overnight? Yeah. As in the hair that already was on his head mm-hmm. went from one color to the other. Well, I would actually have to see that because I actually think what it means is it starts growing out out of a yeah. different color. Right, so right. Okay. by overnight, meaning he will never again have pigment yeah. in his hair. Then the new hair yes. starting now is going to be gray. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. If I were... and, and he had a horrible thing, right? He, yeah. he had like two broken legs, a broken arm. They beat the shit out of him. They wouldn't right. set his arm when they caught him. They tortured him while he was in the hospital forever. And, you know, that's why he still, or at least until he passed recently, walked funny and had all that stuff going on. Like he was tortured as a broken, beaten man and like... Like, yeah. had really horrible things happen to him. I wonder if there's a lady out there who's a, a blonde. Yeah. Right? But then, like, you know, her roots are showing and she's growing a brunette. No, it turns out in science, like, if you could actually be scared so much that you come in a brunette, like, the hair would start going in. It would be the other yeah. way. <laughs> but, I mean, like, I'm just a natural blonde normally, but, like, I was scared by a poor person. And <laughs> so we have evidence of these things having happened, and we have a lot of individual or anecdotal stories, but we've never known how. And for a long time, scientists have been trying to figure it out. So the first thing they thought, they were like, hmm... Immune system sometimes attacks this. This happens in alopecia, people who who uh, don't have any hair on their body. Their immune system literally attacks hair follicles. So like, maybe it's some version of that. So they- We're ge- not going to get you laid. We're tired of all the sex you're having. Die, hair <laughs> follicles. They did a genetic knockout in mice for that immune system reaction. And yet, those mice still lost the pigment when they were scared. So then they tried a new thing. They thought, maybe- It's hormone levels. Bill mentioned hormones earlier. Maybe it's something like cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Maybe you overstress them, right? That's what's happening. John McCain is getting overstressed, and then all of a sudden he has a flood of cortisol, and maybe that happens. So they do another knockout, take cortisol out of those mice. Same thing. Still turns gray. So now they're like, fuck, what could it be? And in thinking, they go, well, the sympathetic nervous system, which is part of our fight or flight system, that's there. And actually, it does signal to these hair follicles over here. What if there's an overstimulation? So they tested this out in mice, and what they found was in those super stressful events, basically the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, way overstimulates the stem cells that are responsible for pigment production within our hair follicles. Now, eventually those stem cells peter out, they get mutations, or they just degrade over time, and that's why people turn gray over time. They can no longer produce that pigment. What happens here is it overstimulates them, forces them to all express themselves at the same time, and you literally run out of the pigment producing stem cells because of an over excitement of the sympathetic nervous system's right. fight or flight response. So you do you get like one last moment of vivid color as it all is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, who knows? But in the right pink. Yeah. <laughs> but what's crazy about this is like one is that seems irreversible unless we have some kind of weird stem cells treatment. So it's not like something that's going to be easily fixed. But number two, I love this part of science. I love it where we go. Here is a natural phenomenon. This is science at its greatest. Here's a natural phenomenon. We don't know how it happened. Let's investigate. I'm pretty sure it's this thing. It's got to be cortisol. Holy fuck, it's not cortisol. It's, not. Yeah. I, it's- gotta be this thing it's gotta be the immune system attacking it it's not right i love it when we find that we're wrong and we keep going until we find out the right answer and i think this is an example of science at its best something interesting to think about though i thought about this when i was reading all the studies and i wondered how many other scientists thought about this think of what they're doing right they're doing genetic knockouts in mice then seeing if they turn color that means that it's somebody's job every day to torture and scare the shit out of mice until their hair turns a different well, color. This is old news. It's <laughs> a lots of people's jobs to torture yeah. mice. No, every no, no. Day. There's a lot of people whose job it is to give mice a slight electric shock. There's a lot of people whose job it is to use Pavlovian conditioning to teach mice how to go down a maze. There is not a lot of people whose job it is to literally torture a mouse until its hair turns there a different are, color. There's a, there's a test for depression where you. Put a mouse. Would you slaughter a mouse? <laughs> no, you put it. You put them in a tank that they can't get out of. Yeah. And you time how long it takes them to give up. Oh. This this <laughs> indicates how depressed they are, how much they value their life. <laughs> so it, like, what what's a worse torture than that? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! Isn't every cage a cage they can't get out of? I mean, no, no. It's like a, it's like I a, feel like that's called the Midwestern. It's a cage. glass <laughs> tank with no side, and the oh. the water level is like halfway up. And you just drop them in there. There's like. They can't go anywhere. That's crazy. (laughs) All right, article number three. Researchers have found that soybean oil, the most common oil used for cooking and additives in the U.S., appears to have an impact on Alzheimer's, autism, anxiety, and depression. Both of you guys thought this was bad science, and this one is science 
at least it is in mice. Specifically, the scientists found huge effects of the oil on the hypothalamus, where a number of those critical processings take place. So it seems to impact at least 100 genes that all have some kind of neural sensitivity or neural impact, including genes known to be at the cause or one of the causes of autism and anxiety and depression. So these genes are being directly impacted by soybean oil in our food. When you say directly impacted, you mean like like they're being turned on or off? Mm -hmm. Yes, like they're and, and their regulation is hard to determine. So it seems like it might not have the same reactions in different people. So some might be turning on, some might be turning off. Now, soybean oil is incredibly common here, but it, we're not saying soy. This isn't soy milk. That's not going to do it to you. Tofu, not going to do it to you. Soy oil is a different thing. Now, it's used for a lot of cooking, so you might in imbibe it that way, but it's something interesting to think about because whenever we see these things that are affecting gene regulation or gene expression, this doesn't mean that it's causing that genetic condition. You know, autism would still be a genetic condition. It's just being impacted, affected, ramped up, maybe even ramped down, whatever it is, by the impact of the genetic expression of those 100 genes by this particular product. Really interesting, and one of those yeah. things that I call a door or an opening door study, meaning this has opened the door to what I imagine will be about a thousand more studies that look at how much soybean oil, what processes, if you fry it in this way, does it take it away? What is the level of impact? Is it different between men and women? We have discovered a phenomenon, and now we have to narrow down on how and why it works. This is a big opening for the canola oil industry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you said both of us got that wrong, correct? Yes. Now, you started off the answer segment. Damien, let me, saying, let, me, let, me, let me finish my job. Stop trying to jump ahead. <laughs> let me finish my goddamn job. I, Your job is to answer questions. My job, my job is to read the answer. My job is to be the bad student in class. <laughs> All right, and lastly, article number four. Researchers studying scientists isolated in an Antarctic research station for 14 months found that their brains actually increased in size oh. during their time at the station, likely as a response to the bitter Antarctic cold. Damien thought this was false. Bill thought this was true. And this one is... Bad science, meaning Bill gets a perfect no-point game, <laughs> yeah. as we have discussed before, shooting the moon, shooting the moon and winning. <laughs> I call BS. Congratulations, Bill, on I your did it. epic victory. <laughs> Epic victory. Uh, epic victory. So a scientist comes in here. It's harder to get uh, them all right. Uses his scientific and, and analytical reasoning mm -hmm. to incorrectly come to yes. four <laughs> Which is difficult. That's difficult to do. <laughs> it's difficult, but you're rewarding. You're rewarding a bad student. You're rewarding somebody who came in and used bad science. Damien, did you get all the answers right? I got three right. I was one away from a perfect. So why didn't you do that you one? Got none why right. didn't you get that one right? <laughs> I'm just asking, like, why didn't you get that one right? Which one was it? I feel like there's a different standard being applied to a person with less expertise. One perfect. Wait, one got perfect. One didn't get perfect. But you're saying your non-perfect should beat I, Bill's perfect? This is our job. That's a weird assertion to make. I mean, that's a weird complaint. No, I, you complain about a lot of stuff on this game, and it's outraged the fans. But this, this is probably the worst. It's a negative perfect. This is this, probably there's a, there's the a worst. Sign oh, okay. Perfect. Oh yeah, that's what I get. I saw that a lot of reports. Cards negative perfect. Perfect is good, Damien. Zero percent, one hundred percent are not the same thing. Stop implying that they are. This is our criminal justice system right now. Bill is a billionaire who is who is picked up for being a pedophile, and I am a lowly street offender for drug of possession, and I am getting a life sentence thrown at me. And he's gonna have his death faked. And it's going to get to move to an island. Wait, hold on. How, how is that analogy <laughs> making any sense? You're absent. I, I get to win. Stop molesting kids. I get to bill. win on a podcast, and this guy gets murdered in a cell. Which one of those is? <laughs> well, 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 I'm first it depends what your kink is. First of all, <laughs> I am implying that you're not actually dead. I am implying that you're living a consequent free life, surrounded by underage girls in a Caribbean <laughs> island adjacent to the one that you already own. Wow. Okay. So they did indeed. They found the opposite in this. They found that their brains actually shrank. Now, this is something we'll have to talk to Dr. Nick about, because as we've talked about before, Dr. Nick, he's an astrophysicist who comes on the show every once in a while. He actually goes and does research down in Antarctica every single year. So we'll have to ask him how this works and if he notices these effects. But basically, it was because of long-term isolation. So you're talking about 14 straight months. During the summertime, they do get visiting scientists that come by. But all the other time, it's just them, those those people down there. Isn't it a healthy group of people, like a couple hundred? No, no, 14. This is just over a dozen human beings. So like small group. In looking at these people, they found that those people who stayed there for that entire time had an average brain size decrease of 7%, which is pretty darn significant. But basically, they say not only is this isolation, but there's a lot of people who run off into cabins in the middle of the woods or communes and stuff, and they're isolated too. And if you have social contact, that's usually not a bad deal. 
here's what really ups the ante in Antarctica. You can't go outside. Yeah. Right? So, like, it's basically a space station. You are stuck in this room, at least for six months out of the year, you're stuck in there. You might be able to walk 10 feet outside, maybe, on a good day. But other than that, it's negative 40 degrees. The winds are coming at 200 miles an hour. It's cold as fucking as a snowstorm. uh, So, the Antarctic is the southern pole, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I think there's probably hundreds, maybe, in the Arctic but not there's the Antarctic. there's probably a few hundred in the Antarctic. I think yeah. believe there's six Wait. to eight research stations in the Antarctic. They are spread all around. There's one that's like literally right at the South Pole because they're astronomers looking down the, that way. But okay. then there's one or two inland, and then I think five around the coastal region. Oh, okay. So there's yeah. I mean, a hundred wouldn't be a bad estimate. I think. Would the existence of a holodeck within this Antarctic research station mm-hmm. be able to uh, substitute for? That's a good question. Go like, I wonder if you could. Uh, now, holodeck you can't do, but I wonder if like VR goggles would help. Like, VR is actually really good now. Like, it's getting to a good yeah. spot, and you can yeah. go out and be like, my wife and I do VR all the time. We literally went last night. I have a fear of heights, and there are games I cannot play because even though I can tell myself it's I am realistic. sitting on a first yeah. floor in a room in Ocean Beach, yeah. I cannot look down at that plank that fe- appears to be 50 feet uh, above a skyscraper and walk yeah. out on top. It on is it. pretty uh, absorbing. Yeah, yeah, so I wonder, that's a good point. I wonder if like something like VR goggles might alleviate some of it. Well, that. they probably have like UV lights, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's not, it's, I don't think it's the lighting. It's not thing. the vitamin D yeah. or something. There was a Morpheus type character who was potentially scouting Bobby mm-hmm. for you know to help free us from the Matrix. And as soon as Bobby said that, like even within a VR, yeah. even though he can tell himself that this his inability to separate himself from his fears yeah. and push himself beyond expectations means that I'm sorry, Bobby, you're not the one. <laughs> well, I've been told that before. <laughs> yeah, your wife told you that <laughs> yeah, times. Yeah. But persistence, persistence, <laughs> persistence. <laughs> and mind handcuffs. control serum. Mind control serum. <laughs> Well, congratulations, Bill, for dominating Damien and I Call BS. And congratulations, audience, for being with us for 400 episodes of science, including this one where you learned all about how biomarkers might give us a blood test for concussions soon, how traumatic events turn people's hair gray, why soybean oil might be affecting your neurological health, and how being isolated in an Antarctic research station can cause you to lose 7% of your brain mass. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back next week for Science Faction 401. Sometimes I'll try to sneak up and scare my penis because I want that distinguished gray look. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.